My name is Philippa McGuinness. I'm the executive publisher at UNSW Press New South Publishing. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all this morning um, to the launch of what is a very important book. Of course, I would also like to thank Gilbert and Tobin for hosting the launch and for their ongoing support through their centre at UNSW, and I know that they've been a great support of Jane. I, I think that um, Jane and Fiona's book is something that there is a crying need for. This morning I was talking to a colleague who said, oh, you're going to a book launch, what's the, what's the book? And I said, it's Refugees. And she said, well, that's timely. But I pointed out that at any point in more, well over a decade, any discussion about refugees has been timely. There's so much panic, anxiety, misinformation around the refugee and asylum seeker in this country that I know you will all agree that having a book that brings such insight, intelligence and clarity to the issues is extremely welcome and necessary. At UNSW Press, we're extremely proud to have published it. And let me tell you, we are going to work as tirelessly as these authors are to make sure it gets into the hands of as many people as possible. I'm going to tell you a bit about the extraordinary women behind this book soon. But first, we're going to hear from the launcher of the book, Admiral Chris Barry. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome him here. And as I prepared a few words, to introduce him to you, I realised how lucky we are that Chris could do the honours for us today. His CV, as you can imagine, is extensive and admirable. I'm trying to say admirable without saying admiral. Um, but he joined the Australian Navy more than 50 years ago and his naval career has included a seven-month tour of Vietnam in 1969 on board the HMAS Brisbane. This was followed by appointments as commanding officer on a range of ships, some of which I was struck by um, their exotic names. HMAS Vampire is not a ship I'm sure I'd want to be on, but of course he was on board the um, HMAS Anzac and Melbourne. Less expected, to me anyway, as I was just saying, was a period he spent in New Delhi as a defence advisor in the early 1990s. And not only does Admiral Barry have a bachelor's degree in international law and policy, he has an MBA as well. He was promoted to admirable and assumed, ad, see I did it, admiral. He's an admirable admiral and assumed the position of Chief of Defence in 1998. He retired from the Navy in 2002, but there's been no withdrawal from public life. He's made very informed in, and insightful observations in his role as a writer and commentator on a range of issues, including climate change and international diplomacy, but more frequently on the many questions and crises that are associated with asylum seekers and government policy towards them, including the current government's Operation Sovereign Borders. I'm thrilled he could join us today, and please join me now in welcoming him to the stage. Gilbert and Sullivan would have been pleased with the admirable admiral. <laughs> um, it gives me a, a great deal of pleasure to be here this morning because this is a very important issue that we're going to talk about. It was a few weeks ago when I was reading my email traffic a little more carefully that I realised that what looked like an occasional email from Jane McAdam was actually an invitation to launch a new book on Australian refugee issues. Today, I welcome the opportunity to launch a new publication on refugee issues written by Professor Jane McAdam, Cientia Professor of Law and Director of the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law at UNSW, and Fiona Chong, a recent Law and Economics graduate at the University. Professor McAdam has published many books and articles on international law and forced migration, and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Refugee Law. It was almost three years ago today that I launched a book here in Sydney on a similar theme written by one Hassan Nakul from SBS Radio. He, with his family, had been an escapee under artillery fire during 
Lebanon Civil War in 1989. That book was titled Overboard. You would not believe what really triggered Australia's controversial policy on boat people. It drew the bulk of its material from experiences of many people who had made perilous trip boat trips to Australia in order to tell their stories. And it was focused on the circumstances of late 2001. As Nakul explains, as a boat person who has been through his own baptism of fire, I can understand what it means to tango with death on the edge of nowhere. In this book, Nicole tells us it was an interview with a people smuggler that played a key role in putting end, an end to boat people arrivals. The interviewer was, of course, himself. In the expose, we're told that the people smuggler actually said to him, if Australia doesn't really want them, it should return the boats, just once. If they send back one boat, no one would be coming, right? That same people smuggler claimed he was doing a humanitarian thing for these people because of the number of illegal migrants living in Indonesia at the time. Concurrently, as I'm sure many of you will know, I was the CDF and thus in command of Australia's military involvement in Operation Relics, an operation which was launched specifically to deal with an estimated several thousand people who might be on their way to Australia this way. Moreover, to really help things along, the people smugglers insisted that the asylum seekers of that, of that day should destroy all papers they carried to put the onus on the Australian authorities to sort out claims for protection. And it is on the record, I believe, that some of these people claimed to be from places they had never lived in. Operation Relax was based on a number of important principles. And I think these might be a surprise given the context of the day, notably that we were in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 and our initial commitment of limited military operations in Afghanistan. So what were these principles? First, a fundamental rule of engagement issued to all military forces involved was that no person should lose their life in the carrying out of this operation. This rule attached to our people as much as it did to people seeking asylum and even indeed asylum, uh, people smugglers. Second, there was an expectation that the launch of Operation Relics would provide for a greater level of safety at sea than had prevailed up to that time. Many of the boats that were being used for this one-way trip were in very poor condition, invariably overcrowded. In short, the launch of a focused surveillance operation to try and detect these boats might reduce significantly uh, the risk of drowning at sea. Third, it was vital that our military forces did not see asylum seekers as the enemy. Our instructions were clear. People coming to Australia in this way to seek asylum must be treated with compassion and dignity whilst we are trying to carry out the elements of Australian government policy. After launching Nicole's book, I met a woman in Sydney who told me she was the manager of an Arabic-speaking radio station in the west of the city. She had been trying to get someone from our Navy to go to the radio station to do some work on air to persuade young people in these newly arrived families to join the Royal Australian Navy. She explained that through all the vicissitudes of getting to this country through people smuggling networks and beyond, there was one organisation that stood out for the way they treated asylum seekers with dignity and compassion, and these were our young people, young Navy people, in the boats carrying out Operation Relics. Let me now turn to the themes of the book to be launched today, called Refugees, Why Seeking Asylum is Legal and Australia's Policies are Not. The book that Jane and Fiona have written is very readable. It covers just about every kind of issue concerning asylum seeking that I can imagine. And it is plain speaking on the truth of the situation and on the treatment of asylum seekers. It should be widely distributed. I'd like to say it should be distributed as an insert in our weekend newspapers <laughs> or put into the back pocket of all seats on commercial aircraft flying on the Australian domestic <laughs> network. It's a very good read and a captured audience might actually pick it up and read it. I hope it will gain a very wide readership. As it traverses all the issues associated with Australian government policy on asylum seeking, 
and how we treat people who seek our protection and points out the relevance of various aspects of the law to the current situation, I believe many people would be surprised at where we have come. So, what are my major impressions from reading this book? First, we are in a mess. The situation reflects badly on all of us. Remembering that most of us at one time were brought to Australia by sea either forcibly or voluntarily. Indigenous Australians, of course, often remind us that our arrival in Australia has not been a good outcome for them. Two days ago, I saw in the media a story that tells us how this is so. It referred to the Immigration Minister's written briefing to the Parliament. We're told that the Abbott government has sent one asylum seeker back to Syria and several others back to Iraq through voluntary return packages last month, while at the same time setting aside 4,400 resettlement places under its current humanitarian program for Iraqis and Syrians affected by the current security crisis. That's certainly got to be double handling. Altogether last month, 412 asylum seekers from Australian detention centres and, one off and the offshore detention centres on Manus Island and Nauru had been returned, including one asylum seeker from Syria, six Iraqis and 48 Iranians. Yet on Sunday last, Mr Morrison warned of the dangers in both Syria and Iraq when discussing Australia's role in fighting increasingly real terrorist threats and the risk of what is happening in Iraq, in Syria, and what it means for Australia. We are advised that the Immigration Department has been offering voluntary returns to Syrian refugees since February. Early this year, monetary offerings were increased to remove any monetary barriers from asylum seekers going back to their current origin. Right now, there are 2,393 asylum seekers who are being held in Manus Island and on Nauru. Second, it seems to me, and I, and I hope you will find this the same, it seems to me that on reading this book, we Australians are doing our utmost to, dis to extinguish hope. Hope that most powerful of all human emotions. Yet, here, we are all of us in a country of so-called fair-minded people, but we don't seem to want to hear, we don't seem to want to see what is being done in our name in the context of these asylum seekers? Or have we so demonised these people that we think of them as subhuman? Just as we demonised an enemy in Vietnam so many years ago so that we could pretend what we did to some of these people did not matter, here we may be doing the same thing inside our very own communities. As I was looking for a barometer on this question, I found it an emotional and disturbing essay written by Chris Selkis, author of The Slap, in the monthly last year, entitled, Why Australia Hates Asylum Seekers. In it, he sets out a range of concerns covering these kinds of matters and accuses us of racism. I do not have time to go through all of his article, though I commend it to you if you've not read it. An, ex an extract will suffice. Our governments and press have demonised boat people for 15 years. We have failed. You can't rewrite this recent history, centred on the abandonment of a bipartisan agreement on immigration policy and multiculturalism, a reactionary moment that stretches from one nation to Tampa to stop the boats, and sloganeering, and now to the PNG solution. And we haven't had a discussion about challenging racism in this country which I observe seems to be a theme that Adam Good, our Australian of the Year, is chasing at present. There can be no doubt that the great majority of people who come to Australia using people smugglers are leaving desperate situations behind them, by choice, under trying conditions, and seeking hope for themselves, or more especially their children. So it is disturbing to read this book for today, how the current methods for dealing with these people will lead to a situation in which they can be incarcerated forever without any hope of a fair trial or treatment that we would accord even to violent criminals in our own jails. Third, 
The words mandatory detention, which have been a characteristic of Australia's treatment of asylum seekers since the Keating government introduced it in 1992, is a euphemism for some of the worst jails we can think of. I'm not sure that we should continue to use the word uh, words, mandatory detention, when we actually mean jail. At least in Australian jails, the incarcerated have rights of access to legal support and representation. These jails, no such rights exist. Much of the accepted treatment of asylum seekers stems from the way we've politicised the issues. Our political parties have used them in point scoring exercises from one government to another. Solkis has a great deal to say about this aspect. <laughs> of course, none of these people can be represented and they thus, present, thus prevent what I now describe as the demonising of these people by the process. Finally, under the current circumstances, I see no exit strategy from any of the processes we currently use that will take the monkey off our back in terms of cost to the taxpayer nor assure Australians of good outcomes in terms of our future economic prospects and indeed beavering to help balance the budget books. The current operation Sovereign Borders and Associated Mechanisms for Managing Asylum Seekers and a Processing People to Find New Homes does seem to me to be outrageously expensive for a country that was built on immigration. Looking to the future, I ask myself these questions. Will this problem disappear and at what point will we, be, will we be able to stop conducting Operation Sovereign Borders? Well, let's just look at the facts. First, few countries in our region are signatories of the Refugee Convention and Protocol. Australia and PNG are notable exceptions. But interestingly, on the Index of World Corruption, Australia ranks uh, at number nine as one of the least corrupt countries in the world. PNG ranks at 144 out of 175. That's a, that means to me that a lot of our money to support the Manus Island Detention Centre is going to end up in people's personal bank accounts. And Cambodia is even more corrupt, ranking at 160 out of 175. So why don't we stop and ask ourselves, what are we doing? The costs are enormous. According to the National Commission of Audit in 2014, the government sent $3.3 billion on the current system of detention and processing of asylum seekers. The fastest growing government program on the books, with projections over the forward estimates amounting to more than $10 billion. And thirdly, the numbers of people seeking asylum in Australia will become more and more staggering. In today's world, UNHCR's 2013 report estimated that there to be at least over one million asylum seekers globally, representing an increase of 15% over the 2012 reported figure. Germany is the country with the highest number of claims at 109,600 and has also suffered the largest increase at 70%. Let us now imagine in a world of nearly 10 billion people around 2050 with increasing numbers of people displaced by natural disasters and the impacts of climate change as well and an ongoing global security problem. How many people do we think will want to come to Australia? In my view, not just one or two. My point is that we will be under a lot of pressure into the foreseeable future to find a satisfactory answer for this problem. And we should be working on it right now. This is an important leadership question for Australia. We must continue to work on making better countries for people to live in for their own protection. But a read of a newspaper today cannot give any confidence that we have any viable solutions for solving this particular problem. And we also need to remind ourselves about just how hard it is for people to leave their country of birth and seek protection and hope in another country. A tough choice by any standard. Finally, let me tell you a story of a young man I met during a meeting with Prime Minister Gillard's expert panel. He was an Azara from Afghanistan. During that panel meeting, he told us how the Taliban had made it known that he would become one of them 
or be shot. In response, he was able to flee Afghanistan and make a journey to Australia in a people smuggling operation. He told us about his experience of the journey and what was very interesting was the standard of security of the operation. It was impressive, showing that people smugglers are not amateurs. I asked him how he came to know who to talk to to enter a people smuggling operation. His answer was that he had no knowledge of how to get in touch with people smugglers. It was in fact his parents who put him into the queue and they paid the money for him. He also said that his younger brother in turn had received a similar threat from the Taliban and his brother had been smuggled into Iran. I think this story demonstrates some of the complexities in trying to deal with this issue. None of us who are parents could doubt for one minute the kind of motivations that young man's parents went through. But there are not many choices when push comes to shove. I of course assume that many of you here today are associated with the work of trying to secure a better deal for asylum seekers who seek protection in Australia. I commend you all for doing the kind of work Australians ought to be proud of. I'm also sure that the work can be rewarding when you see lives successfully transformed by the hope generated by the opportunity to have a fair go. Now it gives me a great deal of pleasure to launch the book, Refugees, Why Seeking Asylum is Legal and Australia Policies Are Not. And may I take this opportunity to applaud the work of Professor Jane McAdam, Fiona Chong and all the staff at the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law at the University of New South Wales, as well as Andrew and Renata Caldor themselves for a fine philanthropic gift to the nation. Thank you so much to Admiral Barry for those very powerful words. And I know that many of you will have been as pleased and as frustrated as I was to hear the word leadership in there. There's not much of that. But I'm pleased to say we're now going to hear from the authors themselves. Um, I get so many emails from many, many, many people, eminent and not, but I have to say that Professor Jane McAdam has the most impressive email signature of anyone. <laughs> I think it's pretty much unbeatable as a matter of fact. Um, not only is she the founding director of the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Law at UNSW, um, and of course many of you will know this is a new centre which is clearly in Jane's hands, her capable hands going to thrive. She's also the Scientia Professor of Law at UNSW and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. She happens to be a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. All that is packed very neatly into her signature. But if she included everything that she does, it would be the longest email signature in the world. Um, and I'm not going to list everything she does, but quickly let me mention that she's a research associate at Oxford's Refugee Studies Centre. If I were to list her publications, we'd be here till lunchtime tomorrow but I'm going to mention two more things. She's co-rapporteur of the International Law Association's International Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise, which, which gives you an indication of the extent of her involvement with the key issues of our time. But perhaps even more fearlessly, she's a regular commentator in the Australian media, and I'm sure that many of you, like me, learnt how to pronounce the word refoulement because I heard Jane on the radio talking about it. Um, but perhaps the question that you're really thinking about is how did this woman with so many responsibilities manage to write a book? Surely she missed her deadline. Surely she couldn't answer copy editorial <coughs> queries. And as for proofreading, I bet that went out the window. No, she delivered on time. The book stuck to its schedule all the way along. And there are people who are far less busy than Jane McAdam, let me tell you, who don't manage to tick any of those boxes. So, you know, give her a hug on my behalf and um, on, on, my, on behalf of my colleagues as well. And, of course, she's been ably assisted by Fiona Chong, 
who I know has benefited from Jane's generosity, but Fiona has made an enormous and substantial contribution to the book as well. So I'm thrilled to welcome such eminent people, scholars, and lovely women to the stage to talk to you. Thank you so much, Pip, for that uh, lovely introduction. I greatly appreciate it. And I appreciate the fact that you've all come along today for the launch. Thank you so much for giving up your time to do that. First of all, Chris, I want to acknowledge on uh, Fiona's behalf as well um, how grateful we are that you were able to launch the book for us. It means a great deal to us. And I think your reflections and endorsement of the book um, really were, were very powerful, so, so thank you. It's a great honour to have someone of your stature and experience do this for us. As an international lawyer, I'm often asked, does international law really matter? My favourite response to that question was by a high-profile English barrister who said that the fact governments paid him a million pounds a year suggested that they certainly thought international law did matter. While I unfortunately can't produce the same evidence to demonstrate its existence, I do think it's fair to say that it does matter. Just ask the army of international lawyers working in the Attorney General's department and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. You might also ask <coughs> the Immigration Minister, who regularly seeks to justify his actions as being consistent with international law. Australia wouldn't bother using international mechanisms to assert its own rights under international law if it didn't think it mattered. And for instance, just this year, the Australian government won a case before the International Court of Justice against Japan's whaling program. Australia also has a strong interest in making sure that international trade law is open, equitable and enforceable and it's turned to the World Trade Organization many times to enforce its rights. Indeed, our foreign minister recently said, and I quote, Australia cannot afford to have an island mentality in relation to international trade law and investment. This is a sentiment that could and should be applied to the refugee context as well. International law provides us with a universal normative framework against which to assess Australia's policies towards asylum seekers and refugees. Right now in the international community, there is both dismay and bewilderment at our treatment of such people. International institutions like the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, as well as a number of the UN Special Rapporteurs, have continually highlighted the ways in which Australian practices breach key international treaties and place individuals at risk. This is doing a lot of damage to Australia's reputation as a good international citizen. As citizens, we need to stress that our treatment of asylum seekers and refugees be consistent with the values that we as Australians hold dear. The quintessential value of a fair go for all embodies concepts such as tolerance, equal opportunity, mutual respect and human dignity, all of which also lie at the heart of international human rights and refugee law. Australia's policy should ensure that durable solutions are available for refugees. That doesn't mean that Australia becomes a soft touch, but rather that it walks the talk and respects the commitments that it's made to other countries under international law. We decided to write this book as a way of debunking some of the misunderstandings about refugees and asylum seekers that seem to have taken hold in the community. Successive governments, aided by certain sections of the media, have exploited public anxieties about border security to, to create a rhetorical and ultimately a legislative divide between the rights of so-called genuine refugees resettled in Australia from overseas and those arriving spontaneously by boat. Political leaders of various persuasions have relied on emotive language and images 
to exploit people's fears and insecurities instead of taking a principled stance on asylum, explaining the complexity of forced migration and explaining why Australia has protection obligations to people at risk of persecution and other serious forms of harm. In doing so, they've conjured up the idea that Australia is facing a border protection crisis that can only be combated with the discipline and focus of a targeted military operation. Our book tries to show why this approach is flawed. Immigration department statistics over recent years show that the overwhelming majority of people coming to Australia by boat are in fact refugees, around 90%. This means that the likelihood of Australia breaching the principle of non-refoulement when it turns around boats or tries to induce people to return home with repatriation packages is real. International human rights law compels us to treat anyone in our territory or jurisdiction in accordance with basic standards. We have to also remember that these standards set a floor, not a ceiling. This means that while we are processing asylum seekers, we must treat them with respect, dignity and humanity and not keep them in indefinite detention, exacerbating and at times creating mental health problems that will have long-term impacts for them as individuals but also for the communities that ultimately they will join. I think it's important to situate today's challenges within a broader historical and global context. Displacement is an age-old phenomenon for which there is no silver bullet solution. Refugee movements by their very nature are complex and messy and desperate people will resort to desperate measures. National responses won't work unless they take account of the broader global context. This means recognising that boats will continue to come for as long as the root causes of displacement remain unresolved. This is therefore a long-term challenge that will be there for as long as there is oppression and discrimination in the world. We also need to recognise that in global terms, we receive but a fraction of the world's displaced people. We need to acknowledge that comparatively, Australia is in a very strong position to provide people with protection who need it, and that neither our society nor our economy will collapse if we do. <coughs> And finally, we need to recognise that as a democratic, multicultural and wealthy country, we should model behaviour that is not only consistent with human rights law, but that goes beyond our minimum obligations. Fiona and I would like to thank a number of people who helped make this book a reality. First, we'd like to con convey our gratitude to UNSW Press for their professionalism, their dedication and the speed with which they produced this book. As you might imagine, in this policy area, things change very rapidly. And unfortunately for the press, there were a number of changes required, even in the days when we were trying to finalise the proofs. Everyone was very accommodating and supportive. And this has certainly continued into the post-production stage as well with the marketing and distribution teams. In particular, we would like to thank Heather Cam, Philippa McGuinness, Rosina DiMarzo, Matt Howard, Beverly Cameron and our ever patient editor, Jean Kingett. We'd like to of course thank Gilbert and Tobin for hosting the launch today and all of you for coming along to support us. I'd like to thank my co-author Fiona Chong, who was an absolute pleasure to work with. She began as my research assistant a couple of years ago and during the two years that she worked with me, her substantive knowledge of the area developed to such an extent that she was the obvious person to co-author the book with. Her fine-grained analytical and research skills and her clarity of expression were a really great asset and her dedication to the task at hand was unbelievable. Co-authorship can at times be challenging because people have different ways of working, different styles, different approaches and different expectations. But I can honestly say that writing this book with Fiona was one of the easiest co-authorship experiences I've ever had. Finally, we would like to thank the Dean of UNSW Law, Professor David Dixon, and of course, Andrew and Renata Caldor for establishing the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law almost a year ago to the day. <laughs>
one of the aims of the centre is to communicate refugee law research to a broader audience, and the book is one way in which we hope to do that. Speaking of which, it's Father's Day on Sunday, <laughs> and although we might not be able to solve the worldwide refugee phenomenon, we can solve your dilemma about what to give Dad on the weekend. <laughs> Table's over there. Thank you very much. I'd like to echo the gratitude that Jane has just expressed to everyone who has helped to bring this book into being. Thank you very much to Chris Barry for coming today and for sharing your insightful remarks with us. It's a real privilege to have such a distinguished person to speak to the book and um, to share your perspectives with us. Thank you to the team at UNSW Press for your enthusiasm and your incredible commitment to making this book happen. Thank you to Andrew and Renata Caldor and the Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law at UNSW for your continuing generous support. And thank you to Professor Jane McAdam for giving me the opportunity to work on this book with you. Jane is a truly remarkable scholar. Her contributions and her leadership in the sphere of international refugee law have been extraordinary and it has been such a pleasure and a privilege to be able to work with you. As Jane has mentioned, we have aimed to write an accessible book, to reach an audience, not just of lawyers or academics, but anyone who would like to make sense of the refugee, refugee debate in this country. We hope that this book is accessible to adults and school students alike. It is important for everyone in Australia to know the facts behind the asylum seeker story. For too long, politicians have been able to garner support for tough border protection policies by essentially manufacturing a crisis. Over the last two decades, our refugee policies have been based on widely disseminated, commonly accepted, but deeply problematic notions about asylum seekers and the phenomenon of refugee movement. This is a serious problem. When the root causes of refugee movements are understood, our policies are counterproductive. They breach international law. They come at significant taxpayer expense. They come at the expense of our good relations with our neighbours. And most fundamentally, our policies cause real and unjustifiable harm to other human beings. One of our aims when we were writing this book was to highlight the perspectives and experiences of those who have been on the receiving end of Australia's policies. Where possible, we have aimed to provide real life examples to bring to life the analysis in our book. It strikes me that one of the reasons that successive Australian governments have been able to gain public support for policies of deterrence is because the consequences of Australia's policies are largely invisible. For example, what happens to asylum seekers who are intercepted on the high seas is not disclosed to us. And we are told in effect that this secrecy is for our own good as for asylum seekers who reach Australia, they are detained in remote domestic locations or sent offshore. And this removes any real possibility that we might get to know them as neighbours, colleagues or friends. The guiding framework that we use in our book is that of international law. As Jane has mentioned, international refugee and human rights law is important because it takes as its starting point the idea that all human beings should be treated with equal dignity and respect. And that idea is the basic premise of our book. Jane and I have thoroughly enjoyed writing this book and we hope that you enjoy the read. Thank you. We're at the end of the formal part of today's proceedings, but thank you so much for coming along and spending an hour thinking and listening to people talk about, at, at base, three basic principles, respect, dignity, compassion. So thank you, Jane McAdam, Fiona Chong and Admiral Chris Barry, and to you too, thank you to Gilbert and Tobin and finally, I would like to thank Abby's Bookshop for being here and selling the books, which, as instructed by Professor McAdam, you will be giving to your nearest and dearest.
Um, I know that the authors will be very happy to sign your copies. Thanks for coming. <laughs>